Rolling. <laughs> Everybody ready? Great. No. <laughs> Let's hear it for weed. Yeah, that gets a rise out of you. Okay, great. That was not a product placement, by the way. Um, hello. I'd like to welcome you to the fourth gathering of the Pioneer Valley Cannabis Industry Summit here in downtown Holyoke, which is in its own right shaping up to be a center for our fast growing industry here in Massachusetts. Uh, my name is Michael Cusack. I'm the publisher of Different Leaf Magazine, which should be in your hands in about two and a half weeks. Thank you. If I don't fall over at this microphone, it will be a small act of God, because I'm very tired. Um, and I'm the newest member of this planning group for this great event, which I guess gets you made MC. And so how I hope you'll indulge me for a few minutes while I talk about why, why we're here tonight. Um, the mission of the Pioneer Valley Cannabis Industry Summit is to provide community engagement opportunities for our local cannabis industry. Um, and I think that's really important and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, I'm a newcomer to the cannabis business. Uh, when I started planning this magazine at the beginning of 2018, um, I knew little about the plant and I embarked on this project and certainly felt fears about my lack of education about cannabis and how my ideas would be received by um, what I perceived to be a very tight-knit community. Um, I made a few phone calls to some friends who I knew were active in cannabis, um, and they introduced me to more and more and more and more people um, who were beyond overly generous in their willingness to share their experiences in starting and growing not only plants, but businesses. Um, so here I am a year and a half later. I am far from an expert, um, but I feel like I'm like this close in my cannabis MBA, like a year in. <laughs> so I have enough knowledge to be dangerous. Um, and I think that's why uh, events like this are crucial for all of us in the early days of the Massachusetts cannabis industry, regardless of how much we know. We have many experts that we can all learn from, and as a business community, we should take advantage of what we can learn from and teach each other. Here at the summit, we hope that by your presence here, you came to learn and teach as well. So, um, Thank you for indulging me and sharing that with you. Um, I want to take a, a, a little bit of time to acknowledge the other members of our committee who helped pull this event together tonight. Um, and they put in many hours. Um, Julia Agron. <laughs> Hemp Goddess. Frank Daly from Boston Bud. <laughs> Seth Frappier from Chronic Trips. And Karima Risk from just being fabulous and uh, a verb, the herb. Um, if you need assistance, have questions, keep a lookout for any of these wonderful people and they will certainly help you. Um, and now the requisite list of thank yous. Um, so please hold your applause. Uh, um, we have a number of sponsors who I won't list by name, but they are in our program book, and without their generosity, tonight's evening would not be possible. And please make sure to visit their tables, find out what they can do to support you um, in your business endeavors um, in the cannabis industry. Um, I want to thank David Schur uh, for hosting our meetings at Canal Gallery. Um, <laughs> Lori, VTech, and Rachel, and the entire staff of Gateway City Arts for being such a wonderful home for weed in Western Massachusetts. Um, Scott McPherson of Holyoke Media, who's provided the equipment to record this evening. Um, the Massachusetts Recreational Consumer Council for being a phenomenal partner in spreading the word about this event. Uh, Sarah Coming, our ga graphics designer, who put it up with so many last minute changes. She's really a saint in that, uh, uh, in that case. 
Um, our volunteers, Addison Olson, Carmen Ricaba, Evan Dancero, and Laura Gonzalez for doing a lot of running around for us tonight. Um, our panelists who will be introduced as the panels come on. Um, and we had some gifts for some of our presenters this evening and we'd like to thank The Healing Rose, Medible Extracts, My Own Different Leaf Magazine, and Chronic Trips for providing uh, some goodies for all of our panelists this evening. Um, we do have a couple changes to the schedule. Um, both Horace and Kebra had um, personal issues that they had to deal with and they will not be joining uh, us this evening. Um, but Vanessa will be joining both panels, yeah. which gives her immediate rock star status for, uh, for jumping into the breach there. And so we want to thank her for that. Um, we have two panels tonight, Fighting the Good Fight, How the Little Guy Survives which is our first panel, and Balancing Equity in the Cannabis Industry. Um, we're going to hold a discussion for uh, a, an amount of time nobody told me, and then um, we're going to be doing uh, a question and answer, which I will Oprah the crowd for questions. So um, thank you again all for coming, and I'm going to turn this over to Karima and our first panel. Welcome everyone, I'm so psyched to see each and every one of you. Thank you for coming, yay! Right. Um, I'd like to welcome to our first panel. It's called Fighting the Good Fight, How the Little Guy Survives. And tonight we're gonna highlight a variety of small businesses across the cannabis industry. Um, they've had many different roots and a lot of really rich experience to share. So um, I encourage you to listen to their stories. Um, this is a networking event, so definitely reach out. We'll have a short time afterwards. Um, immediately afterwards, we'll have a question and answer period, a few questions, and then once we conclude the whole program of panels, there'll be a short period after you can catch them if you didn't talk to them. All right, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then they will give a brief um, little summary of, of who they are and why they are here to represent us in the Massachusetts cannabis industry. So immediately to my left, I have Beverly, Beverly Barish of Wicked Chronic, so thank you for coming. Um, I have Seth Frappier of Chronic Trips. I have Kristen Mara of the Pioneer Valley Extracts. I have, let's see, Vanessa, oh, I don't even have you on my list, Vanessa Jean-Baptiste of Legal Greens. And then next to her is Eric Schwartz of Farm Bug Co-op. And finally, there's Frank Daly of the Boston Bud Factory. So why don't you kick it off, Beverly, um, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. My name is Beverly Barish, and I'm owner and um, proprietor of Wicked Chronic in Natick and now Shrewsbury. We have two locations. Um, I began... Excuse us, technical difficulties. One moment. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Okay, so my experience with cannabis began when I became a patient. Um, I attended the Northeastern Institute of Cannabis in the summer of 2015 in my hometown of Natick. I was curious. Um, whether cannabis was actually a medicine or was it all bullshit. Um, so I attended the, uh, the school, met Dr. Uma, and became a patient the very next day. Um, total immersion after that. Um, it helps my fibromyalgia, migraines, and arthritis tremendously. It was a life-changing medicine for me. Um, I thought it was so fantastic, I wanted to dedicate my life to it. I started growing it, I wanted to open a store to help people like myself who are older and did not have the experience of cannabis in college years and high school years. Um, and that is what Wicked Chronic has been comprised of. We opened Wicked Chronic um, April of 2016 in Framingham. We suffered a fire the following March. We weren't open a full year before we suffered a catastrophic fire. Um, three, year, uh, three months of dealing with insurance, we opened in Natick, uh, July of 27, 2017. 
And just this past month, we opened in Shrewsbury. So I have extensive experience opening a retail store. I've done one approximately every year for the past three years. Hello, I'm Seth Frappier. I founded Chronic Trips. Uh, Chronic Trips is a community of elevated adventure, fitness, and wellness enthusiasts. Sounds pretty fun, right? So we get together once a month, we schedule adventures, and then we go out and do that together. Um, so I started that about three years ago, and it's been a wild ride ever since uh, legalization came about, and every day something changes, and so you're always playing the roller coaster, being flexible, and all that jazz. So I'm happy to be here and share uh, what I can with you. Thank you. Kristen Mara, I'm the VP of Operations at Pioneer Valley Extracts. We are a, a products manufacturer, a cannabis products manufacturer in Northampton. We are provisionally licensed, and like you, it's been a bit of a wild year and a half, um, and we're still waiting for our final license, working on our build out, um, and plan to have that done fairly soon. Um, we plan to grow, do retail, and kind of do the full vertical. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to be um, part of this local scene and helping to build it. So so thanks. Hi, I'm the president of Legal Greens. I'm um, a criminal justice. I just graduated from Bridgewater State as with criminal justice and sociology. We are trying to open a, two retail stores, one in High Park, one in Dorchester. And I have a host agreement in Brockton for cultivation. Ooh. Uh, my name is Eric Schwartz. Uh, I'm co-founder of Farm Bug Cooperative. Uh, we're in the process of applying for what's called the Craft Marijuana Cooperative License. Um, I'm an activist. I'm a uh, entrepreneur. Um, I wear a lot of hats, I suppose. Um, and yeah, that's me. <laughs> well, this is the worst part of this thing, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm the worst in talking about myself, so um, where to start? Boston Bud Factory will be located um, just down Ray Street, the other end of Ray Street, so 73 Sargent Street is where our retail dispensary is located. We also hold a provisional license for main product manufacturing at that site, so we hope to manufacture our own products and get those up and running, you know, given that there's a supply at some point. So uh, supply will be the limiting factor, I think, for everybody. <laughs> So, but um, well, I've been on this path for about a year and a half, transitioning from uh, corporate America into trying to uh, start my own business. So, and I, I see that. I spent a lot of years making a lot of people a lot of money and watching that money never get back to the communities and making it off the backs of their employees, and I just got tired of it. If I may, I would just say ditto on that, that last statement there. Okay, save it for the panel, guys. <laughs> so, um, as, as this development, as the industry develops locally, remember to support the local guys, because those are the guys out here please. doing things in the community, and um, make sure you know whose products you're buying. Awesome, and that's exactly why we're here today. To introduce myself if you guys don't already know me. My name is Karima Risk. I am a local. I live in East Hampton, Massachusetts. I believe it's the most yes. amazing community making, you know, social, passing social equity ordinances. A lot's going on in cannabis in East Hampton. So if you don't know about it, check it out. Shout out to city councilor over there. Oh, and Derek. We got to do this. I'm, it is truly my privilege to host this panel. Um, I've worked um, in, in the Massachusetts medical dispensary environment. Um, I also had my own small business, and uh, Cafe Vare was my venture. It's a social consumption venue, and that's something I put on hold, um, but it's been a bold venture. So I, I share um, everything, putting yourself, your money, your family's lives on hold for this venture, and that's something we all share, and I'd really encourage you to Follow these guys and their stories, and then also um, become customers. Support them through your revenue, because these are the local Massachusetts uh, businesses we're gonna see. All right, so without further ado, let's get this started. Uh, our first question, um, my first question is about a term in the startup ecosystem called the pivot. 
Almost all startups reach a point where their original business strategy is fundamentally challenged, and the entrepreneur must decide how, if at all, to pivot or shift to a new business strategy. The decision will often determine if a business fails or succeeds. Please describe a time when you had to pivot and how it changed the outcome of your business. How, if at all, did the pivot strengthen your business? And we're gonna just kick off with Beverly and we'll go right down the line. Thank you. Okay, so I guess our first pivot was the fire. We suffered a catastrophic fire in our strip mall. And even though we didn't do anything wrong, we lost absolutely everything. Um, so we kind of looked at each other and, and immediately dismissed that this, this absolutely, this isn't the sign, this, is, this was just coincidence. Um, so there really wasn't a whole lot of talk about whether we were gonna fold up and do something else. We, we immediately started looking at real estate, what else was available. Um, in that time, we had voted for legalization that had taken place. And when that happened, um, section eight of that um, bill, um, lead, uh, decrim well, paraphernalia, paraphernalia shops like what I was planning to launch in Natick, suddenly we're going to be okay. Up until then, I needed a tobacco license. And after the vote, I no longer needed a tobacco license. They were considered cannabis accessories. Um, so it actually did help us. We were able to get into a better town, into a better location, thank God. Um, and everything seemed to have worked out well at that point. Um, Natick, the Natick store has thrived for the past two years, so much so that we've been able to open um, a second store in Shrewsbury. Um, second pivot moment is happening right as we speak. Mm -hmm. MDAR has issued a statement. As m many of you may or may not know, um, CBD is very gray in this state right now. Um, what they've done to hemp in general is it, it, they've just made it incredibly confusing. Um, so we can no longer sell CBD in edible form in retail stores. We can no longer sell any CBD that uh, uh, makes medical claims or have, has the word dietary supplement um, in any of their advertisement or on their packaging especially. That's more than half my stock right now, I can, I'm not supposed to be selling in Massachusetts, nor is anybody else. Um, so again, we're kind of looking at each other like, what do we do? Um, and again, it's kind of a no brainer. This is my medicine, this is what I use, this is my life changing um, thing, this, this is it. So we're just gonna suck it up and wait it out. We're finding our voice. Um, there is a meeting two to four in front of the state house the Massachusetts Hemp Coalition was formed in like f overnight practically. It's, I think, what are we up to? We're up to almost like 50 individuals, uh, businesses that have come together to kind of come up with an answer to this statement that MDAR has put out. Um, so I guess this is my pivot moment and, and I'm choosing to fight, which I believe is the title of this panel. How we fight, we have to fight. Unfortunately, in this industry, you've got to fight for absolutely everything right now. Yeah. Thank you. Seth? I can't reiterate basically everything Beverly said. It's really important if you want to stay as a startup or as a small business to really fight in this current climate. Um, but if I was to add something, I would add having a strong mission statement from the gate and really thinking about what it is that you're trying to do really can help you move along and navigate through this current environment. Because I had a pivoting moment and it was because of my mission statement that got me to where I am today. And so if I didn't listen to my mission statement, I would, uh, I would definitely be on a path where I might, have, I might waste more money, waste more time and waste more energy than I could afford and maybe fail, who knows. But, um, I think having a really strong mission statement and knowing what you really want to do from the gate, from your heart, from your passion, whatever it is, uh, really matters because there's a lot of muddied water out there and it gets really muddy really fast <laughs> and you can lose sight sometimes. And so 
if you just continue to read that mission statement and every night you'll can, you'll stay on what you're trying to do so thank you Kristen yeah I, I um I really agree with that Seth I think you know having a really strong mission and knowing who you are and what you want to do is really important um, but I think in any startup environment, you have to be ready to pivot. It's really dynamic, and especially in a very highly regulated market like we're in today. Um, you know, like the CBD policy coming out, all of that is, you know, you have to be ready to move quickly, you have to stay nimble. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've done the same. We have a, um, some CBD products, so we're also trying to figure out what we're going to do there. But in any business atmosphere today, I think if you're not staying light on your toes, you're going to get caught up. You know, I worked for a long time um, in a very well-established industry, which was also very highly regu regulated. Um, and even there, you just you have to stay very nimble. So for us, one of our pivot moments has been, um, you know, Frank, you mentioned supply. Supply is going to be a really huge issue. When we started our company, we applied for a manufacturing license, and we said. We're just gonna, you know, we're gonna get a bunch of trim and we're gonna just squeeze that stuff and there's just gonna be oil for everybody and we're just, everyone's gonna wanna buy it. And lo and behold, oh, there's no trim. There's, oh. there's no supply, there's no growing, right? So lo and behold, we're now applying for our grow license, we're applying for our retail, <clears throat> excuse me, retail license. Um, you know, we have to go full vertical, at least for some amount of time until everyone gets online. So we're sort of pivoting in that way right now, and with the CBD. That's great. Just uh, highlighting, there's many ways to pivot. I, I think yeah. that's really important, whether horizontally, vertically, internally. So Vanessa? So in my process in Brockton, um, we wanted to do retail. But with Brockton, they have a limit, which was eight. And um, while I was going through the process of trying to get a host agreement and speaking with the mayor, um, he gave all the host agreements away. So by the time I learned that all the host agreements were gone, it was too late for me to get one for retail. But I was told that I could get one for cultivation. So then we also had to pivot from doing retail to doing cultivation. Um, in that same location that we wanted to do, we wanted to see if we could do a variance. But we were told that it might not work. So now we're, we found two other locations that will work how Brockton wants their regulation. So now we're discussing with um, investors to see if they can purchase the location because you can't um, get like a loan or a regular loan within this marijuana industry because federally it's illegal and we don't want the feds to come down and shut us down. So we're trying to go with investors. So yeah, that's our pivot. But we have a host agreement, so we have no choice, but we're going strong with it, so. Thank We're going Vanessa. for it. <laughs> Eric? Uh, so our pivot was actually internal. Um, and, you know, the Globe, uh, Karima, has not covered co-ops that well. So I'm, I'm happy to give you a farm bug uh, exclusive. But um, our, so, you know, here's the deal. We had a very specific strategy to get a um, craft marijuana cultivator cooperative license. Um, I lobbied extremely hard to get that in the regs. It got in the regs. It's there. Um, we've been going after the entire time. Um, I think that it's a difficult license to get, and I think that there's a lot of risk right now as a startup in the business. But the bottom line is, I think that growers need to be in or out, basically. And we're striving towards that license. We have certain deadlines. And our pivot essentially came to a point where we were essentially like, listen, you're either down with the vision and our strategy, or you're not. And it came to a point where certain people weren't. So we decided at that point to find the people that were. <laughs> and it was literally like dropping a dead weight, and we've been going extremely fast towards that license ever since. So I think that it's about finding your people, finding the people that believe in your mission and your vision. Um, and just from a financial standpoint, I will say that I think part of the apprehension was that the whole time we've basically been like, listen, as soon as we get a license, that is like license to print money in Massachusetts. If you have a license to grow marijuana, we have people literally saying that they want to buy trim 
We'll sell you the trim. We just need the fucking license. So when, <laughs> when you get the license, that's when all the investment comes in, okay? So I'm not talking to investors until we get the fucking license. Yes, we have a list of investors. We have plenty of people that want to invest in cannabis. There's people that don't understand cannabis. They don't understand how it grows. They don't understand anything about it. They want to get in because they want to make money. The license means money. So we've been working very lean to get the license. And what I would say is we came to a point with certain people that we were working with that weren't down with the strategy. So we decided to do the break. We pivoted and game on, game on. Farm bugs going. <laughs> How do you follow that? Um, I think that if you look around, every business represented up here has pivoted probably more than once to survive. Um, the entire path for us has been a pivot. Um, our plan started with a retail store above a building that we already owned. Um, unfortunately, it was on the wrong side of the street. So, um, and once we figured out that they weren't gonna allow us to rezone that, we switched and we're lucky enough to find a good landlord in town that um, had um, uh, enough area that we could start small with room to grow. So, um, everything it becomes a pivot, but then it becomes about money too. So then we're, every time you get to one stage, there becomes another pivot. So, and, and supply will be the next pivot. I've, I've got no idea how I got through licensing. So, once we get to the next part, we'll figure out supply. <laughs> Awesome. And I forgot to mention, and I'm going to throw this in with Pivot. Um, so a lot of folks know my Cafe Bear is on hold. Um, I pivoted too, and I was delighted to throw my weight behind um, the verb is herb. We have the owner, Bill Hartley, out in back. He is another small business I'd really encourage you to support. We are opening in East Hampton um, towards the end of the year. And, you know, it's, there's, it's wonderful to get behind one of these missions and one of these ventures. So I'd really encourage you guys to support them. So thank you for letting me say that. Um, our next question is about um, resources and, and being a small business. Without question, small cannabis businesses are at a disadvantage in terms of resources, relationships, experiences, and advisors. Increasingly, small businesses are partnering with other entities, whether nonprofits, multi-state organizations, investors, consultants, accelerators, or strategic partnerships. So for my panelists, I ask you, can you please share how, if at all, your organization has successfully partnered with other organizations to become better resourced and more competitive? Has your experience been positive? What would you recommend to other small cannabis businesses who are looking for successful partnerships? We'll start off with Beverly. Poor Beverly. Great. Um, there's no money. You can't get a loan. Not in cannabis. It's all federally insured. Um, we tried that after the fire. We thought, okay, we're going to do it bigger and better. Now we've had one under our belts. Now let's get some money, real money, and let's play store. No, there's no money. You have to have a plenty of money yourself. Um, unless you find an investor, and I wasn't, I'm still not there yet. We're not there yet. We're not desperate. Um, that's giving up a little bit of control. Actually, it's giving up a lot of control if you're me, because I'm a control freak. Um, I can't do it. Um, as far as, that doesn't mean that you're alone, though. Not in this industry, absolutely not. Cannabis is unique there. I have lots of friends. You can never have enough friends in cannabis, and there's always a friend sitting next to you that's willing to give you a hug, give you some direction, even just some support. Um, I've. Chronic trips, first off and foremost, I think you, you've been huge, um, a big supporter. We've been kind of symbiotic with chronic trips. Um, cannabis yoga, I'm very active in cannabis yoga. Yoga and cannabis is wonderful for fibromyalgia. If you know anybody who has, suffers fibromyalgia or arthritis, any, any of those types of conditions and diseases. Um, so that Dr. Uma, um, go, go to NECAN, go to the conferences, go to things like this, encourage your friends to come with you. We need to spread education. Um, you can, like I said, you can never have enough friends. I've, I've become friendly with so many different organizations. I started with Women Grow, Elevate, 
Um, there's so many out there. We advertise in hopefully Michael's Magazine maybe soon. Um, we also do, um, what's the one, Sensei Magazine in Boston. There's, there's plenty of other avenues um, for you to go about raising awareness, getting advertising so you don't have to spend those funds. Including organizations here, like the MRCC, who's yeah. a great organization partner. Just shout out, sorry. So, please take it away. Um, yeah, just to balance out that, like, sometimes it's not necessarily uh, necessary for, like, these big professional partnerships. Um, I think co collaboration is another word that's really key to how you can really uh, kind of boomerang into a lot of things. And I, I remember a long time ago, uh, you know, maybe three years ago, it's not that long, I guess. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, Joe Gilmore, who is here with MRCC. Panel two. Uh, panel two, uh, excited to hear from him. But he said something a long time ago, and I think we hear a lot of like, if you're not at the table, you're or on the menu or whatever. But he said something else, show up. Yes. Yeah. Right? And so just by showing up, I met everybody on this panel. Uh, so it was really amazing how just by showing up, you start motivating and uh, uh, moving things. And things open up for you, and opportunities open up for you. And you're then starting on this trajectory that you just want to keep manifesting. And you just keep showing up because it's almost uh, addictive. <laughs> right? Because you see all these people, they're all doing wonderful things, and we're all struggling, we're all getting there. <laughs> but it's because we show up, and it's the love of the plant, and to get it and advocate and educate and tell the public and promote it in every way we can, it's really, uh, that's what made collaboration more important than partnering for me. Kristen. Awesome. Um, I think we just take this thing off here. Um, so, I absolutely agree. Partnerships and collaboration are hugely important, especially as we build um, this business here in Massachusetts and particularly in Western Massachusetts. Um, so, um, you know, we've been doing it on many levels. So, you know, we've been partnering with um, local businesses to help us with our extraction and our grow. But we also took a different path and we actually sold our company to a larger company. Uh, we're in the middle of that sale. And so, but for us, the partnership is very unique. And, you know, we still consider ourselves very much a mom and pop. It's my, literally my brother and I running this company. And um, we managed to find a partner that is um, allowing us to continue to do that. So um, they're on the West Coast. They have been running a number of cannabis companies and we're their first East Coast foray. Um, but they're incredibly hands-off. So we managed to find resource and capital and expertise without losing, <clears throat> excuse me, losing the soul of our business. So, um, you know, that's sort of the path that we've taken. Thank you, that's awesome. That's awesome. Vanessa, please. Um, I would say being an economic empowerment <laughs> has helped in this whole process because my, being a minority in understanding that this is like a real business, I've never opened a business, nor do I know anybody that has opened a real business. So it's kind of intimidating. And with MRCC, shout them out, they have really helped me integrate and meet people and I guess make me feel comfortable in this space because it's very intimidating meeting city councils and mayors and lawyers and all of that stuff, even though I want to go, like, I, I'm a criminal justice and I've met lawyers and I want to go to law school, but meeting people who've been in this industry for a very long time, it's very intimidating. But being an economic empowerment, thanking the CCC for all the work that they've done, it's helped me a lot. And just shout out to the CCC, Shakia Scott, is she around here? She's, she's here representing the CCC to talk about, if you have any questions about the social equity program, we really appreciate them coming all the way out here to be here if anyone has questions. Um, Eric, please. Uh, yeah, so not to do an MRCC commercial or anything, but uh, <laughs> the, the Massachusetts Recreational Consumer Council has been a partner with Farm Bug Co-op, like kind of since our infancy, I think. Um, I guess I'll tell a really quick story, I don't know. Please, like, we have um, a little time, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I was testifying in front of the Joint Committee on Marijuana Policy in, at the State House, and 
it was Sonia, their original co-founder, that grabbed me. And uh, I met with Sonia Kamani, the co-founders of the MRCC, like, uh, I don't know, like maybe a month later or something like that. And, you know, it was just like we were talking about the industry and how the consumer needed to be educated and, and education, education, you know, a lot of the, like mantras or whatever. And uh, it was just like, wow, they get it, you know, they, they get it on my level and they understand it. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've been working with the MRCC, I mean, on and off, I guess, Joey, for um, ever since, basically. Um, so yeah, it's. That partnership has been great, again, not to do the commercial or anything. <laughs> I don't know, Joe, you're gonna put in this a commercial or whatever, but uh, so that <laughs> partnership has been great. Um, but also, um, you know, it's been a lot of like uh, internal, uh, wearing a lot of hats, doing our own thing, and not spending money where we necessarily have to spend money. And I think that's where the small guy has advantage, or small guy or girl, sorry, has advantage essentially is, um, it, the big guys seem to waste money on things that they are just hire, hire a lawyer for that, hire this, hire that. I've done the advocacy for farm bug co-op since the beginning. I've turned to a really, really good lobbyist since yes. the beginning. I can, I can uh, say that. <laughs> and it wasn't because I wanted to be a lobbyist, it was because I wanted to be a marketer and help cultivators come to market and help my marketing skill help these small farmers and these great marijuana craft growers and bring them to market and I want to market, but I've been a lobbyist since day one to try to get our you know, model into play and, and through all the red tape and whatnot. So, um, so as much as you can kind of take on yourself, I think, um, do it, but also know where your blind spots are, what you're not good at, and then partner with the people that are good at it. So. Thank you so much. That's extremely valuable advice. Finding, the, finding those partners is some of the hardest things along the way. And knowing which partners actually have value. Um, there's a lot of people that uh, say they know something or have some value. Um, and there's even more people that want something. Um, everybody has their hand out. Everybody wants a donation. Everybody wants a piece of uh, equity. Everybody wants something. And when it comes to financing and you try and get in roadblocks, um, everything is a roadblock to the little guy. So. Um, when you talk, and the, you know, the MRCC is going to have to send me a check now because this is just getting ridiculous. Um, but it's because of organizations like that. You know, when the little guy, when I first started this, um, I just went to the meetings in Boston. Um, I wanted to learn. I had just gotten a severance package from a Fortune 500 company and was trying to figure out where I was going to transition. So I went to Boston every week and I just started listening and learning, um, watching the MRCC, you know, the live streams, everything they're at. Um, then it became a collaboration is that, okay, well, how do we keep Western Mass tied to Eastern Mass? So um, it's been one step after the other in small groups like that. Uh, meeting people like uh, Ezra Parzabak and Green Glove Consulting, Dick Evans. You know, we have some really um, connected people in this audience and, and in this local community um, that don't always get the recognition in the eastern part of the state. So to me, it was important to kind of keep that hold in the western part and keep that connection. And it's through organizations like the MRCC. It's through the CCC who... Um, you know, with all the, the press they get either way, you've got to give them a lot of credit for what they've done. Um, the guidances they put out, anybody that wants to learn about this that says they can't learn about it, hasn't looked into it. Okay, the guidances that are available on the CCC website will almost walk you through the entire process. I still talk to people about social equity and, and areas of disproportionate impact and people that have um, records from marijuana in the past that don't even know that, that these are the people that they're trying to search out. So, you know, this is what this event, this event started at, was to try and bring those people out. How do we bring the equity out of the rafters? Because everybody thinks they're priced out of the market. So everybody thinks that there's no way that they can get a business going, and I'm the opposite. You don't need the money. Go learn how to do it. You can figure it out. And then once you get the license, then you can find the money. Awesome. Thank you. Valuable points. Appreciate that. Um, now, it's a great opportunity. If any of you guys are thinking about starting a business, this will be a very relevant question locally. Um, panelists, now having the benefit of years of experience going through this industry with its you know, pivots and um, undulations, and now you have hindsight um, in the, cannabis, at the Massachusetts cannabis industry, what advice and tips would you give to other cannabis business small entrepreneurs? What would you do differently? Um, how could you have saved time or money? That's so important to the little guy. 
start with Beverly. Um, I don't know how we could have saved time or money. We kind of did it on a shoestring. We're still operating on a shoestring. Um, but I do, my advice to anyone is pay attention. Pay attention to the local politics, especially in the town that you're looking to be, have your business be in. Um, watch the selectmen's meetings, watch the planning board, and above all, watch your board of health because they come out of nowhere. These guys can make regulations that do not require town approval at all. They just do it, and they claim that there's a crisis or there's concern. So watch them, be on top of them, know who they are, make friends, absolutely. Go down to your city hall, introduce yourself, tell them, be transparent. Tell them exactly what you want to do, where you're going to do it, how you're going to do it. Ask them, do you have any questions or concerns for me? You know, how can I make you feel better about what it is that I want to do? Because I know that what I'm doing is awesome and it's going to help so many people and it's just going to be wonderful and you're going to love me in about a year. But they don't know that right now. They're frightened. They're uneducated. They're afraid. Um, so it really helps to go down and just introduce yourself, make some friends, and then pay attention, get involved. Thank you. Seth? Yeah, get involved with your local municipality. That's basically <laughs> crucial. <laughs> um, the shout out to East Hampton because they did a really great job at uh, tackling the voters who said no. They, there's over 30% of the voters of East Hampton, I believe, that voted no, and they get, did a really great job at reaching out to them and being like, why did you vote no? And how can we help you vote yes or get be okay with what's about to happen because it's about to happen. And so uh, I shout out to East Hampton for that. That was really amazing. Another thing I like to point out is patience is key. Although Chronic Trips does not grow any cannabis, I am directly, I'm ancillary, but directly connected to it by way of people wanting to be high in the woods. <laughs> so what, right? And so what, yeah, it's weird. So uh, what I've really just had to point out is just stick to the mission. Like I got, and don't necessarily believe the state like I got caught up in the social consumption thing years ago and that was where my big pivot landed me is because I thought they were going to do things. We anticipated things and things didn't quite happen the way they, uh, the way it happened, whatever, so be it. But, um, but being on the ball and flexible and stuck to your mission and uh, if you're an, as ancillary as I am, you have to be very innovative for what you're trying to do but also stick to your mission, stick to your passion. Thank you, great advice. Yeah, I mean, I really echo what's already been said. Um, it's crucial that you network. It's crucial that you come to events like this. It is really crucial that you talk to the mayor, the city councilors, all of those people. Um, you know, we met with the mayor well before we, you know, in the beginning when we first applied, um, knowing what's coming down the pike. The only, <clears throat> the only way you're gonna know that is if you, if you network. Thank you. Vanessa? Ooh. To add on to that, I would say do research, because when it comes to doing the application process itself, you are going to have to know what they want, what they don't want, how you're going to have to um, write the documents so you can get approved. So it's really doing the research, looking at other people who gotten their applications um, submitted and accepted to know what's going on because there's a lot of people that are going to promise you that they could do your application and it's going to cost a lot of money, but if you really take the time and the diligence to do the research and sit on the computer for hours and type and type and type, you will figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that leads into my um, recommendation, and I do see Dick Evans in the audience now, but we have spent very little on uh, lawyer work, no offense, Dick, uh, because I know the law and I know the regulations and I know how to get a fucking license. 
<laughs> so that's been a zero spend pretty much for a farm bug co-op. Uh, don't get me wrong, we are gonna need lawyers soon, Dick. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I would say don't necessarily think that you need a lawyer uh, audience because what you need to do is what she just said. You need to learn, you need to digest it, you need to understand the law, the regulations, what your strategy is, and get there. Um, and before you figure that out, you shouldn't be hiring a lawyer, basically. Um, no offense, Dick. Uh, <laughs> but uh, other than that, um, yeah, like be versatile. Like I'm a marketer, and I guess what I would say from that standpoint is like, um, <laughs> Instagram is free, Facebook is free, they're all free. Put your message out there and get it done. Like, they're all free. Uh, we've done so much on such a small budget, it's been ridiculous. So, yeah, as, as someone with marketing experience, just, just, I would say it's about the narrative and telling stories and, um, you know, basically giving your vision to the consumer and bringing the consumer into the marketplace through your vision. Thank you. Yeah, and I have nothing good to add to any of those comments, so um, I'm just going to expound on some of them, because I think it is about the small business, guys, and, and finding ways to succeed. So it's back to pivoting, it's back to collaborations, it's back to networking, it's back to knowing who does what. Um, showing up is the best thing you can do, is going out and showing up at events, showing up at the community events, watching the um, political side. I've been to um, planning board meetings, I've been to the CCC meetings. Um, I think people think it's a lot harder than it is. It just takes a lot of time and effort. And you'll look at every one of these people on stage and I see posts from them at midnight, I see posts from them at 4 a.m. Um, you have to be dedicated and you want it. If you want it bad enough, you'll figure out how to get it. Um, but there are a lot of people out there that talk about wanting it but don't actually want to do the work. They either want to buy it, um, they want to steal it, um, or they want you to do all the work for them and they might share something with you later. So it's being really careful about who you actually partner with, who you collaborate with, um, know everybody. Get out there, um, show up, meet everybody so you know everybody, but just be careful who you get in bed with. If I may, if I may, us activists call those vampires. Be wary of the vampires. Oh, yes. yes. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so th thank you so much for all your formal comments, panelists. Um, again, just um, really appreciate them. It's so important to support your local businesses. These are the guys who are going to thrive. We're going to have a little networking time. I'm just going to pause briefly and, and say, for each of your ticket sales and each of the sponsors, we thank you because genuinely this provides us the opportunity to provide this platform for community engagement in the local cannabis industry. So thank you so much. We're going to keep doing that you know, every six months or so. So thank you. Each of one of you have contributed to that mission. Um, so on the next portion, we're going to pivot ourselves as a panel and throw it over to Michael. Um, we have the opportunity for a few questions. Um, if you could raise your hand, we may be able to take a two sure. or three as time allows. Yep, we've got a time. A, a couple ground rules for Q&A, just so we can keep this moving along and get as many questions in. Please state your name, who you'd like to answer the question, or if it's to the panel. And then your question, please keep clarifying comments short. Um, and we'll invite you to come back to be on a panel if you have a lot to say. But please keep it to questions just so we can get as many people in. And who has a question? Thank you. Frank, this is a question for you. What are the things that you absolutely have to spend money on? Ooh, um, if you ask me, there's nothing. Uh, I'm the cheapest person around. Um, and I think that goes back to pivoting. I think that you will get to, you'll reach points where you have to make decisions, and, and some of that will be laid in front of you, and you'll have to just see which path you take. So um, I don't know if there's a good answer for that question. It's a tough question to answer. Um, I wish I had better answers for you. We invite you to have a drink in the half hour allotted for networking time after the event. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Glenn Shealy, and I have a question for Beverly. Beverly, when you had your fire, did you have a marijuana rider on your policy? No, I'm not a dispensary. I don't touch THC. Oh, okay. So but your loss was covered? It was covered. Yeah, they covered me completely. 
<laughs> it took calling her every day for three weeks to get my check because I, record time. She said, you got all your stuff together in record time. Well, now everything's online. Everything's in the cloud. It was easy for me to grab my inventory, my backup, all the invoices behind the inventory, my sales. It was incredibly easy. Um, so I got it to her in probably three weeks, and then she sat on it for two and a half months. Okay. Thank you. Hi there, Adam Black. Um, just curious for the whole panel here. Uh, in, in the time that you've opened your business, what is the one thing, if you, if you could only pick one thing to go back and do differently, what would it be? Anybody want to tackle that first? Gosh. I would have applied for the grow license right away. <laughs> um, I, I second that because, you know, I, I added to manufacturing thinking that I was being smart. Yeah. And now that I'm there, I'm like, oh, God, you dummy. I should have gone for the cultivate too. Exactly. But it was back to picking the resources and money. And every one of those licenses is $5,000. So if you're not going to use it for a startup, that's a lot of money to put out there. Real problems. Anyone else want to share? Uh, it's, yeah, it's someone on the production side. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, as someone on the production side, uh, don't uh, spend a lot of time on growers that aren't serious about getting a license. It could be controversial. I think a lot of my time has been spent finding the right team, too. <laughs> uh, so uh, think about kind of your operation, mission, vision. Find the right people to help you out with it, and they're out there but you just gotta find them. Um, the more directly connected to the plant you are, the easier it might be f to find your team. Um, the more ancillary you are, the more innovative you are, uh, the harder it might be. Anyone else? No? Um, I, I'd go back to knowing the businesses that are out there too. We have a lot of businesses here that have a lot of local ownership. So making sure you know what business you're supporting and who owns it. Um, there are businesses that um, put a big local face on and don't necessarily do anything in the community or have anybody that actually lives here, spends any of those salaries in the area. So um, educate yourself, watch where you're buying stuff. Awesome, thank you panelists. Our next question. Hi, Jason Bagan, uh, Buddha Brothers. We're opening up on 604 Main Street, uh, cultivation, manufacturing, and dispensary. I just had a quick question. Uh, when do you guys plan on actually get up and running with the whole uh, flower situation? I mean, do you guys have a game plan on who you're getting it from? I mean, what's going on? Because I, as far as I can tell, there's really nowhere to go. I, I guess I'll take this first. Um, we're targeting next season, plants on the ground. Uh, well, when you say opening up, like, I feel like that's more of a retail, like, you know what I mean? Well, uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, we're talking, we're talking, you know, gee, we're talking apply November. We're nail talking, you down. What's your best <laughs> estimate? Come on. Just give listen, us a listen. month. In cannabis, you always, you always put yourself back and back and back. The All final answer is... <laughs> Uh, we'll be ready reason. May next year. How about that? All right, Fire there we go. All right. Anyone else? I know Frank's opening a retail store. Kristen, you also have a... Um, I hope more of these guys show up. I hope you guys get open soon. It's, the more little guys that get open, the more the supply chain is going to solve its, uh, its own problems. So the faster we can get sh uh, stores open, the easier the problems will get solved. If you get plants in the ground, I can buy from you. If you just got to hurry up. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for our panelists. Oh, sorry. One more. Oh, the battery's dead. So I have a question about folks who have investors. Oh, the battery's not dead. Uh, folks who have investors that are not cool investors. What is it like, and you might be able to help me, um, <laughs> to sell your soul and be strung up in the hot sun. I don't know, like for your, for your passion. Like, I'm really spooked about this. I don't have a million dollars in my back pocket, you know? I All right, I might be the only one with actual investors. Um, so I have investors that don't suck, first of all. Um, so that's really important and um, you know, this is a business that my brother and I started. I've lived in Northampton for over 25 years. Um, I'm not letting this business go to just anybody. So we're pretty selective about that. Um, but I can imagine that if you do have an investor that sucks, it would be pretty bad. So, um, 
you know, that's not the case for us, thankfully. But I, I, do, <clears throat> I do think it's really important that you know who you're working with right. and what you're getting into yeah. and, who, and who you're getting into bed with, absolutely. And just be smart about those because there are i've heard horror stories about investors that will put the money up but they wanted um all ownership and or excuse me all control so um the um the business basically would have to give up all of their control over the business they would still have ownership but they would have no say in how the business was run so type b shares i think they call that so there there are a lot of shady deals out there so um, be very careful and i think the smart ones will find good partners um, because they'll vet them and they'll go through the process and they won't just uh, jump at the first offer. So I, I have kind of a specific answer to that question. Um, we're forming a co-op. Uh, co-ops actually are more successful than traditional co-ops, or sorry, co-ops are more successful than traditional startups over time. They have a much higher success rate, um, I think basically because it's democratic because the cultivator are actually making decisions, they're voting as to how the business should move forward. Generally, that means that people are engaged in their business, they're excited about it, they have say in it, so that means people will be more productive. So, for co-ops, that's a very good thing if you're a conservative, you know, uh, uh, f uh, you know person on the finance side. Um, but it also means you have to get a more progressive um, investor because they cannot own the co-op. The cultivators own the co-op. So the payoff over time, the trajectory may not be like a, you know, it's Fortune 500, you get this many shares, whatever. That's not how it works out. But the payoff over time, I think, is good in the sense that you have a less risky financial, you know, investment, basically. So. In um, we're going to wrap it up, but I just wanted to weigh in one quick comment, too. I went through this, and I, if anything, um, I went through three months of vetting investors with my own venture before. Um, and, and just taking your time and do your due diligence. I think that's really important. If people aren't consistent, they're going to fall out, so that's an important factor. Um, and just going through that process is, is really important. Um, finding like-minded people, too. One thing I learned, I was doing a social consumption business, and I learned very quickly there's a certain profile of the type of investor. There might be people who want to invest in marijuana, but they want retail, and they're not my investor. You know, I need an aspirational investor. So I think if you can hone in as much as possible who the successful type of investor would be, that can really save you a lot of time. I know I engaged for months with serious investors, but they really wanted a different type type of license, so that can save you a lot of time, too. All right, well, thank you so much. We have an amazing way of speaking. Thank you. Next, we're going to call up Julia Agron, who's the moderator of panel two and the panel two speakers. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.